if nothing else, flexible dieting is a way to individualize the dietary variables to suit the individual's personal preference, personal tolerances, and, and sure. goals. Wits and Weights community, welcome to another episode of the Wits and Weights podcast. Today, we're diving into flexible dieting and evidence-based fitness with nutrition researcher and educator, Alan Aragon. You'll learn about the importance of evidence-based practice for the average person looking to improve their health, rigid versus flexible dietary control, and the practical side of nutrition, such as protein sources and distribution strategies and anabolic resistance. We'll tackle common challenges people face related to behavior change and tracking food, as well as nonlinear dieting, such as intermittent fasting. Finally, we'll touch on the latest findings and research gaps in nutrition and fitness. Alan Aragon is a nutrition researcher and educator with over 30 years of success in the field. He is one of the most influential figures in the fitness industry's movement toward evidence-based information. Alan also writes a monthly research review with cutting-edge theoretical and practical information. His work has been published everywhere. <laughs> it's been published in popular magazines, the peer-reviewed scientific literature. Uh, he co-authored Nutrient Timing Revisited, the most viewed article in the history of the Journal of the International Society of Sports Nutrition, and is the lead author of the ISSN Position Stand on Diets and Body Composition. Alan maintains a private practice designing programs for recreational and professional athletes, and of course, regular people like you and me and him <laughs> striving to be their best. Finally, Alan is the author of one of my newer favorite books, Flexible Dieting, a science-based reality-tested method for achieving and maintaining your optimal physique, performance, and health. His work has personally impacted the way I look at my relationship with food, my coaching practice, and the meaning of evidence-based practice, which is why I was thrilled that he accepted my invitation to come on the show. So Alan, welcome to the podcast. Philip, thank you so much for having me here. It's so great to be here and it's such a privilege. Yeah, man. You, I mean, so you, you are a pioneer of this space. Um, and I've heard you talk about the various stories behind flexible dieting and if it fits your macros and the forums and all that. And you've seen this industry go from, um, from where it was th you know, two, three decades ago to where it is now with social media and everything else. And the fact that health is probably one of the most in-demand things that people are trying to work on you have a lot of great information out there and then you have a lot of misinformation. What drove you to jump in this field early on? What keeps you going? And then what is your purpose in life now after all of this experience and three decades in the field? <laughs> okay. So <laughs> what got me into the field uh, was I just thought that personal training was a cool thing. Uh, you Basically, you got to have a reason to work out and be fit and be be jacked or at least try to and it kind of gave you a purpose for that and um if you can tie a livelihood to working out which is something that i really loved in my late teens early 20s then it just seemed ideal personal training just seemed ideal and then once you dive into it and once you do the work you see that it's hard work <laughs> it's a multifaceted <laughs> and and frankly a, an exhausting job and uh, and I also found out what my strengths were, and what my you know what my limitations were, and um, it just turns out that uh, I was good at teaching, I was good at communicating, and I was much better at sitting around than I was at actually you know <laughs> doing the physical work of training. <laughs> and so, um, but yeah, I did. I did training for a good decade, full-time training. And I think that once you hit the the 10 year point with something that you enjoy enough, uh, then you want to teach people how to do it. And so I hit a point where I, I wanted to be able to teach people how to train. Um, I went into the Avenue of nutrition just uh, because I had to pick a major. Basically I, I wasn't a very um, well pre-planned person mm -hmm. back in the day. I just, I, I really didn't know what to positively and absolutely do with my life. Like some people do in their uh, late teens, early twenties. That wasn't me. I was like, you know, I, I like fitness and there's nothing really out there. Maybe I can be a trainer, but nobody really knows what the heck that is. And, but I'm going to do it anyway, because I, I, mm -hmm. I enjoy kind of being different. So 
um, I went the nutrition path and then a decade went by and then I went the research path for another decade. And then at the end of each of these decades, you're like, you know, that would really cool to be really cool to teach people how to accomplish these things. And, and so here I am at the end of, of three decades. And um, what, what kept me going throughout all of that was just pursuing what interested me. So when personal training interested me less than nutritional counseling, I pursued nutritional counseling. Mm. And when um, the research and education aspect of things really interested me, I just pursued that. So I tried to make it a point of making sure that I really love what I'm doing and I go in the direction of, of uh, basically following my heart mm. uh, on, these, on you know, these things. And so um, the, the final part of your question about um, looking back uh, on the on the industry, uh, I, I'm trying to recall exactly how how you worded. That. I made a faux pas by giving you not only a compound question; it was like three in one. <laughs> it was mm. just basically what it, what it, what drives you today? What is your purpose right mm. now? So you gave us a good thirty year chunked up into three decade story to yeah. get here. So what is it right now? Well, my purpose right now is to conduct research and educate, and I don't think you ever leave being a coach, being um, a trainer or a counselor. I don't think you, you ever leave that. Um, I think it's important to have uh, a handful of, of clients or for some people, patients that they help reach their goals. So, so when you completely cut that part out of your life, then you, you, you cut out the pulse on what works and what works best and how you can sharpen your craft and make it work even better. Mm. Uh, and so, so right now the main purpose is, is education and the research aspects of it are integral to the education purpose. Cause we're continually trying to peel back the layers to get to the heart of what we think we know. And there's kind of a, an unlimited road ahead as far as that goes. And that's why research just keeps going. Man, so your your story resonates with me. Maybe a lot of people. The fact that you just pursued what you enjoyed and kept following, and and pivoting, but everything you had done to that point seemed to build on each other. And it's from day one, you 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 had a common theme here of teaching and communicating, which sounds mm -hmm. like it's it's carried through and it's just added to the the whole thing. And you and I were talking before I even got on the recording. You know, me for coming from the engineering world, I'm now pursuing something else that interested me as well. Uh, in nutrition and combining all these skills together, are what make us unique, right? Like combining your various 10 year chunks of, uh, <laughs> of, of pursuits there gets you to where you are today. So actually let's talk about communication and research because in your book, flexible, to, flexible dieting, the beginning of it, and this was refreshing to me. You didn't just jump into the prescription. You, you talked about scientific, uh, literacy, um, evidence-based practice, the hierarchy of evidence. So let's just start there and define what mm -hmm. we mean by evidence-based practice. Why is it important for the average person who just wants to get healthy? And they're like, just tell me what to do. Why is this important? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, the best way to understand evidence-based practice is to look at the, the, the field of medicine. So if we dig back to the ancient times, there's shamans, there's witch doctors, there's faith healers, there's all kinds of stuff. And so we really didn't know who to listen to aside from the person with apparently the most successful patients. <laughs> apparently the, the person who could most successfully perform his psychic surgeries. And so uh, as the march of history went on and as humans became enlightened and as science became a thing, then we we started realizing hey there's something called the scientific method where um louis pasteur actually discovered that there's a microbial basis for disease it didn't just happen out of thin air and the way that he figured that out was by setting up experiments controlled experiments to elucidate causal relationships between phenomena and between agent and effect here and so um the body of research grew in medicine and we didn't 
we no longer needed to seek out the most successful shaman or witch doctor or faith healer. We could refer to the body of literature and see what science has found mm -hmm. out. And then what we can do is sort of cross check that with what's working in the field. And so this whole model is transferable to exercise and nutrition. And so what, what the fitness world was 15, 20 years ago was a matter of getting the advice from the most muscular dude in the room, <clears throat> getting the advice from the sure. one guy who's got a regular stream of clients <laughs> or getting mm -hmm. advice from the one quack with the best line of supplements. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, it's very, it's, it's a similar transfer to where the evidence-based approach in fitness is taking a look at the research basis of a given claim, um, whether it be uh, a claim about a protocol or a product or some sort of, some sort of phenomenon. And we take a look at the research basis for it and where there are gray areas in the research literature, which there are many gray areas then we can look to field observations and see where we might be able to fill in the gaps in the literature. So the evidence-based approach is really kind of a cross check between field observations and the scientific literature. It's not just a matter of um, anecdote and stories and lore and history and tradition. And it's also not merely a matter of logging on PubMed, finding an abstract yeah and wave it around in someone's face that you're arguing with on social media. So yeah, I think that's, that's important. That's what evidence-based practice is. It's kind of the... Uh, no, and, 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 <laughs> and again, I love the history, the history of that going from the, the witch doctors to Louis Pasteur and cause and effect and now having this as a baseline. And you... You brought up the counter argument that sometimes people make, which is like, uh, well, there, there's, there's dozens, if not hundreds of studies, and which ones do you rely on? And how can you take something that's done for eight weeks with who knows what level of trained individual and they're doing leg presses, but we care about squats and on and on and on and on, where we've got, you know, these 10 coaches who've worked with people for 40 years, they know what they're talking about, don't they? But you're saying it's, it's really a combination of all these things we can validate real world experience with the data or maybe counter it, which is where the magic sometimes happens is when you, you, you get surprised uh, and then looking to field observations. So uh, what was I going to ask about that um, with the, I, I guess you do the research review, right? So how do you select the studies, right? So that's the thing is there's an overwhelming number of studies. Like if you go to PubMed or something and just Google it or go to Google Scholar or whatever, Mm -hmm. How do you select them for your research review so that they're re relevant and they're actionable in the context of what you were talking about? Yeah, that qu that question is um, pretty uh, surprisingly simple. Okay. If you spend enough time on social media and you kind of have your eye on what people are talking about, then you get a steady stream of um, ideas of what people are interested in what studies are floating across the different media um, and what sort of wild claims are being made. And, and so um, with studies floating across social media, you, you have a steady stream of that to begin with. Awesome. Um, there's a couple of examples of that. And I can actually relate the, this, this question with the one which you're probably going to ask which was why is scientific literacy important and mm -hmm. you know how do, how do people gain it and gain a basic understanding of that and i did write i did dedicate two whole chapters to helping people gain a, a foundational grounding in scientific literacy because if you if you're completely devoid of scientific literacy you're easily fooled and you're easily um, you're easily conned. You're easily BSed by various forces in in the media who either just want to take your money, or or just want to take your money. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah. Okay. So so the conversations on social media give me the ideas of what to write about in the research review. Uh, one example is the World Health Organization put out a press release. Uh, saying that uh, you know there there's a sort of a light penciled in recommendation to to not use artificial sweeteners um, because uh, it's 
And I'll, this has sent the evidence-based community in a bit of a tailspin because the World Health Organization is supposedly authoritative. But when they put out this, this soft guideline, they're basically going against a full one half of, of the evidence base behind this concept, behind the topic of artificial sweeteners. So with experimental evidence, with interventional evidence, which is controlled and which does establish causal relationships, you consistently see weight loss. You consistently see sure. fat loss, improvements in body composition, and the ensuing improvements in various health outcomes from substituting um, caloric sweeteners with non-caloric or low caloric or artificial sweeteners. That's a very consistent finding. But in the observational literature, which does not control the variables, you can only make statistical mm -hmm. adjustments here after the fact. But observational stuff, epidemiological stuff, following um, large populations, but not necessarily getting a hand in there and intervening and controlling and establishing these straight and strong causal arrows. Sure. It's mixed. Sometimes there is a favorable association with the consumption of artificial sweeteners. And sometimes there's an unfavorable association. And so <clears throat> those unfavorable associations with artificial sweeteners and disease are what made the World Health Organization just kind of flip a switch and go, oh, maybe, maybe we need to recommend that people don't, don't consume artificial sweeteners. But the big problem with that is when you look at the question of whether artificial sweeteners are good for health or not, and you basically lean on observational data for that, then you open up the possibility for this uh, this confounding element called reverse causality. Causation. Yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> yes. So instead of the artificial sweetener causing the disease outcomes, what you have are people en route to those disease outcomes who decide, mm, I better hop Lose on this weight. diet yeah, product. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah. I better use this artificial sweetener. Um, and so the association is still there, but it's in the wrong cause and mm -hmm. direction. Mm -hmm. And so that is the case with artificial sweeteners. And that's why the World Health Organization and in, in its hilariously infinite wisdom is, is dropping the ball. And so, and so why, why are they, do, why are they doing that? What is their incentive? Is because I'm, I'm is it money? What is their incentive? <laughs> <laughs> that's a really good question. Is I think, it, yeah, personally, I think they're just kind of a bunch of, uh, out of touch hippies, perhaps. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if they're just trying to be too conservative because of some sort of liability if they don't or what, you know, I'm just curious what it is. Uh, it, it may be just a matter of um, people at the top wanting to stir the pot, wanting some attention, just sort of yeah. that basic human need yeah. to gain notoriety and get a little bit of the spotlight, a little bit of the limelight. Um, they did the same thing in 2015 when they tried to push for a recommendation of below 5% of total calories from added sugars, which is preposterous. It is. <laughs> um, they, they also push for a preposterously low salt intake. So they want people eating three grains of salt and two grains of sugar, and then cutting out your artificial sweeteners. Who the hell are these people? Yeah. You know, they, they, <laughs> In the real they world, don't even, are these people? They yeah. probably don't even lift too. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> That's important. Uh, it's so funny um, that I think, so I was talking to, I think it was Eric Helms. We got in the discussion a little bit about seed oils as well. And I've heard you talk about that. And I, I don't want to go down, I don't want to go down the seed oil rabbit hole today. I've got other topics I think we can get into, <laughs> but I think it's a similar, I think it's a similar thing, right? Where there's, I could probably, I could probably too. beat Eric on the seed oil topic. <laughs> it, it was just a, a tangent noob. thing. <laughs> Eric's probably a noob when it comes to seed oils. Oh no. <laughs> I'll let him know you said that. <laughs> All right. Um, all right. So the important thing is to have that literacy and to read the first two chapters of flexible dieting because he gives you, uh, Alan gives you a really good summary of what that is in, in layman's terms, super quick and easy to understand so that you're, you're armed going forward. And I also in the book where you then took off and started talking about some of that research that lays the foundation. One of those was that I now use a lot when I uh, communicate on this as well is rigid versus flexible control right? Mm -hmm. Just kind of underpinning flexible dieting. 
Uh, Cause a lot of people will throw out the, if it fits your macros kind of approach as flexible dieting. And we know that there's, that's not what it is. Um, and what I really learned from the science that started in the nineties, where they started putting out these papers was that the sustainability and the outcome that is associated with the flexible control. So just walk us a little bit through that uh, journey of the literature and why flexible dieting is such a powerful tool based on what we know for rigid versus flexible control. Okay. So we, we got, get into a time machine, go all the way back to the, the mid seventies where um, there is this, this talk about the concept of restraint and how it affects people psychologically. And so there's, there's flexible restraint, rigid restraint, and then we fast forward 20 years and, and the literature dives into rigid dietary restraint versus flexible dietary restraint. And so well, that can be interchanged with the term dietary control. So, sure. so flexible dieting refers to a cognitive style of the type of restraint that you apply to dieting. So the rigid type of control would be a perception of foods and dieting as black or white, all or nothing, a dichotomous view, if you will, of foods and dieting. And the flexible model of dietary control looks at um, a very broad spectrum of um, shades of gray. And so uh, the the flexible model has been compared with the rigid model in several studies over the past couple of decades. And it consistently shows better results. And better results, I mean, um, everything from a lesser tendency to stoke eating disorders and also a better control of weight loss and weight loss maintenance. And so we're looking at better results, <clears throat> both in the, the psychological direction, as well as the, the physical and, and physiological direction. And so it's very clear that there's something treacherous <laughs> afoot when you're taking the rigid dietary control approach. And it's, it seems to be self-sabotaging and it seems to not work in the long term for the majority of the population. And so if we were to look at specific examples here, so a rigid dietary control model would be handing somebody a menu, a script saying, this is what you eat mm -hmm. from here to eternity. Don't deviate from it. Otherwise you fail. And a, a flexible model would be more like, okay, let's say even handing somebody the same script, but saying, you know, as long as you do this script about 80% of the time, 80% of the script. Um, and if you do mess up, don't worry about it. Just get right back on the wagon and keep going. Um, then that would be a bit more of a, a flexible type of model. But I think it's important to, uh, to pan back a little bit. And this is a, this is a sort of a difficult concept to convey, but red uh, r flexible dieting really accounts for the flexibility of dietary approach so if somebody does better by being more quantitative and precise and micromanaging then that's the approach that that individual should take if if another individual does better and can sustain their plan by being more qualitative more habits based and uh, being more just idea oriented and not granular and micromanaging, and they do better that way, then that's the approach they should take. And so there's a flexibility of approach going on here to where something like if it fits your macros, where you're punching grams into an app <clears throat> might actually drive some people, it, it drives some people crazy. Mm -hmm. and, and some people can only endure that for, a few weeks before they go, oh man, this is a real pain in the butt. You know, I can't do this. Then that's, that's not for them. They should be taking a more habits-based type of qualitative type of approach to dieting. And I think that if you can individualize that, then that would be ideal. And there are other 
aspects within dietary programming that can be individualized. And that also falls under the umbrella of flexible dietary control. So uh, a, a rigid dietary control model would say that everybody's got to go keto. Whereas a flexible dietary model would be, hey, if you like keto, you prefer it, do keto. If you like high carb, low fat, then that's what you should do because you prefer it and therefore you'll stick to it in the long term. If you like somewhere in between, hey, then go that way because it's all about doing what you personally prefer and therefore what you can personally sustain for more than just a few weeks or a few months. Okay. You know, if you, whatever you like best is what you'll be able to sustain for a few years or you know a few decades. Mm -hmm. And there are the other things that are flexible within the dietary program are things like food selection. So the IIFYM model has been, you know, very flexible about what you can choose <laughs> in terms of food selection. Okay, and that's fine. And that should be a flexible thing. Other um, programming variables that are flexible are the linearity or non-linearity of your caloric intake uh, through the week or what your intake distribution even looks like through the day. Uh, another variable that can be individualized. And, and really, when you think of variables of the diet that are flexible, you can think of it in terms of programming variables that you can individualize. So if, if nothing else, flexible dieting is a way to individualize the dietary variables to suit the individual's personal preference personal tolerances and, and sure. goals. Sure. And it can even, you can even, you can even customize things like the way that they hold themselves accountable to what they eat. You can, you can uh, individualize the tracking and accountability aspect. You can individualize the way that people approach the so-called hedonic allotment or the, the <clears throat> junk food or the indulgence foods. How, sure. how are they going to um, manage that aspect of the diet? Is it going to be an everyday thing? Is it going to be a once a week thing? So all of these things are flexible. Yeah. And that's, that's the key, right? Cause there, the term flexible dieting gets thrown around a lot with that rest restrictive or rigid definition of calories and macros. And really the entire approach is flexible across many variables. It's multidimensional. It, you know, in your book, you have a few tables that, that give you these spectra uh, along these different variables, which is very helpful. What, what I wonder, this question comes to mind is, is there such a thing as too flexible if you're trying to go for a specific goal? Meaning if you have, for example, a body composition goal with fat loss, doesn't there have to be some boundary that drives you toward that goal that you can successfully follow and meet and know that you got there? Or are we saying that, look, if, if, if you want to take two years to lose, you know, the 10 pounds, because all you, you cannot tolerate any rigidity in that flexible approach, then that's what you do. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, yeah. I would still default to what the individual prefers mm -hmm, and, sure. and how they operate, how the individual, what makes them tick. So um, I'll give a couple of examples. So like, whereas... <laughs> Somebody like Eric Helms might grab a scale and punch in the grams and um, be, you know, do, do his flexible approach that way. You have somebody like Sean Ray who says, you know, I, I just eat less. Um, I, I just kind of go by feel and, and, and I eat less and I'm, if I'm running a certain hunger level, then I know that <laughs> I'm dieting. <laughs> sure. um, both of them will take. Well, actually, Eric will take six months to prepare for a contest. Sean Ray will take three months. <laughs> There's other variables in there that are different <laughs> in their and protocol. Can, sure. And you could still be weighing yourself. It's like that's a separate thing that's not really that's associated right. with the dieting and so on. Right. Yeah. 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 So it really kind of depends on how the, the individual ticks. And um, that and that's sort of the beauty of, about, of the flexible dieting model is it's really uh, usable for, for coaches because they're – coaches are needed to help people figure out what works best for them. Mm -hmm. And if for individuals who are self-taught, well, then that will, that's a good thing for them too. But the understanding is your program and your approach is going to be unique to you and, and what makes you tick. 
Yeah, and honestly, the the a lot of the challenges we see aren't just, for example, macros. Like even if somebody's willing to do that and to track it and understands it, it's the behavior based, the cravings, the hunger, the <laughs> the social pressure, the yeah. emotional <laughs> eating, all of those things that come into play. Yeah. So, wh- like, what's your approach to this in the context of flexible dieting? You kind of already gave the answer: the fact that you have flexibility built in. But is there anything beyond that? Um, I think that just as long as people can focus on the long game and whether they can see themselves, uh, tracking the way they track or, or focusing the way they focus, um, then, then I think it's all realistic and doable Mm -hmm. for some people. They, they truly realize that the most granular that they can get for a lifetime is making sure at least three of their meals have a substantial hit of protein. Mm-hmm. And that they're consuming their meals to a comfortable level of fullness. And that will likely get them to be hitting the targets that they want to hit. Sure. Whereas with other people, it's like, okay, get me the scale and I'm going to be counting grams until I'm 85 years old and I'm going to really <laughs> enjoy it. The most value that I got from this was the fact that I had someone that I could talk to about anything and that there was going to be no judgment. It was just, well, here are your goals. Here's the best way that you're going to achieve it. And then let's work together to help you feel inspired and motivated to do that. And there's a lot of people out there trying to be coaches and not all of them have done the work and also just be a a genuine person that is positive and coming from the heart in terms of wanting to help. And and Philip really embodied all of those qualities. I would recommend him to just about anyone that's looking to achieve goals in that realm of their nutrition and building new habits. Where do you so, fall on that, Alan? Where do you fall personally? Um I, I'm a little bit uh I'm a little bit in the middle as I'm big on on optimizing the diet for for health and, and longevity. Sure. So so I'm I'm aware of making sure that that my diet covers the range of the food groups, and that some people think the food groups is an old school thing to to pay attention to, but the fact of the matter is, we can't just look at the diet as as a set of nutrients. Mm. You know, there's some in quotes <clears throat> magic within the food matrix of the various food groups, and there are hundreds probably thousands of of compounds that we haven't isolated that that benefit human health in within each of the food groups. So I make sure that my diet has something from each of the six food groups, um, every day. And I make sure that, so that's the sort of the, the food selection part of it. And, And then the macronutrition part of it, I make sure that I'm eating about 40 ish, well, let's say 30 to 50 grams of protein four times a day. Sure. You know, and, and then I've got my protein covered. And then um, I just make sure that the meals that I eat are meals that I love. And they're, if you nail the type of meal kind of archetypes that you love, you can just eat that for life. You can have the same types of meals True. Mix for, and match. for life yeah. and, <laughs> and enjoy them every yeah. time. And just like if, if somebody enjoys coffee, you can enjoy coffee for a freaking lifetime, True. every single day of your life. And it can be the same way with, with different meals, different foods. Um, so, so yeah, find, you have to find what you enjoy, cover the food groups, get your macronutrition right with, with protein being kind of the, kind of the foundation there okay, to make yeah. sure that you're, you're getting enough of because it's very rare for people that need to (laughs) really, gosh, I got to get enough carbs. I got to get enough fat. Unless you're somebody who has specific athletic goals, then um, those variables are are, are not terribly important. So with somebody like myself, I don't have to worry about getting enough calories. Number one, I love to eat. Uh, And number two, I do not have a high energy output. Right. And so <laughs> if anything, <laughs> I have to kind of keep an eye on not overeating. Sure. And and so, yeah, it's, it's going to be different with everybody. But with me, I guess the thing that might stick out is the fact that 
I do care about health quite a bit. So I want to make sure I get all the food groups in, in the course of the day and enough servings from the food groups in the, through the course of the day and the course of the week. Yeah. I think I'd, I'd enjoy sitting, sitting down with you throughout the course of the day and seeing what you eat. Cause it, it sounds delicious to be, you know, the, the yeah. more you get. Yeah. So, uh, kind of, I guess the count, not counter to that, but you did mention the other side, the indulgences and treats and things that people like. And of course, a lot of people getting into this journey for the first time or have been struggling ha- have a lack of awareness of how much they eat, what they eat, what's in what they eat, and, and on and on and on. And so there's definitely, there's processes that pe- different people have to go through to kind of level up their education and awareness. But when we talk about treats and indulgences, once you get to the point where you you understand this and you have an approach, what is a sustainable way to do that beyond just saying 20%, you know, an allocation. And I know that's part of it Mm -hmm. for some people, their cravings are, are are emotional triggers. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, some people would do better to abstain and some people might do better to occasionally indulge so that they kind of take the edge off and enjoy what they enjoy. What, what is your take on that? I think this is another department where you have to dive into what the individual's proclivities are. So there is a small subset of people who are better off not having any of the classic junk foods, Mm -hmm. but alternatively, they have to investigate the foods that really fulfill um, that part of their primal needs. You know, like some people will feel an, uh, an incredible reward response from eating some fresh fruit. (laughs) So, Hey, okay. That's great. If you want to stick with that and you don't want to do the cakes and the cookies and the ice cream. Okay, cool. Then that's you. Um, whereas others may actually be able to sustain a diet better if they can have a double scoop of ice cream Mm -hmm. on the weekend. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, or a, uh, an in and out, uh, double, double, let's say, uh, on the weekend or what, whatever, whatever it is, but sort of this model of 10 to 20% of total calories coming from whatever it can manifest in different ways. So like with me, for example, my, uh, in quotes, discretionary calorie allotment is usually chocolate, some form of chocolate. And that, that's usually daily. And so I will have about, I, I probably error on the 10 to 15% of my total calories uh, coming from indulgence foods. Mm-hmm. So an example would be about two to 300 calories of some kind of chocolatey dessert. Um, it's, it's usually a little closer to 200 than, than 300, but it's, it's chocolate. I can add nuts to it. I can add peanut butter to it. Uh, and I, I truly enjoy it. I don't need to dive into an entire cake to, to get that, that itch scratched. Um, because I know I'm going to have it the next day if, if I want to. And so as long as it's framed for the person's kind of just mindset to perceive this as this is something I can take or leave. And, and this is something I can have every day if I want or not. And when that mindset is established, then the kind of indulgence and the for, forbidden fruit aspect of the food and the power that the food has over the individual is, is kind of taken away. Yeah. And, and yeah. so, so yeah. That would, that's a, that would be the approach. And that's a great way to put it, the forbidden fruit aspect, the power it gets taken away. You earlier mentioned your hedonic allotment, and <clears throat> that's sometimes a term I hear used, or uh, what is it called? Planned hedonism, you know, mm-hmm. planned higher yeah. calorie day. It, it goes really for all of this, and it, it goes back to the rigid versus flexible approach again of once you set rules on the people, man, we just rebel. We like mentally, we just don't want to be told what to do is the way I like to put it. And so when you're telling yourself you can't do this, it's just, just, uh, it builds, right? It just builds till you, oh, till yeah. you it, give into that it temptation. Does. Yeah. With, mo- with most yeah. people, it does. Yeah. And in it, fact, yeah. with people with binge eating disorder, hmm. the vast majority of them have it in their mind that they're not allowed to have X, Y, and Z foods. You know, this list of foods. I am not allowed to have these foods. They have that in their mind. And those are the precise foods that they binge on. Got it. 
Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, so, okay. So we've talked a lot about the control or the restraint aspect. Uh, I maybe talk about, you mentioned protein for a bit. So I, I did want to ask you, like this, this has come up quite a bit um, with some other coaches I've talked about the split between pro- protein sources or, or foods that you eat and the sources you get, uh, in, in other words, animal versus plant and all the various outcomes, muscle building, but also cardiovascular health and lean mass and all of those things. Is there like a hierarchy of when it comes to selecting food to get our protein or does it really always come back to just get enough, spread it throughout the day and have a diverse diet with like the six food groups and you're good? For the majority of the population, dude, um, <laughs> what you just said yep. is going to apply for the majority of, of the sure. population. That That is right on, actually. But for people who are nitpicking towards the, you know, the fringes and, and the, the, yeah. the limits, the optimal aspects, then it's going to come down to omnivorism. It's going to come down to including both animal and plant foods as far as protein goes but theoretically you know you can construct a diet that that'll help you live to the 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 mean the mean high higher end age or a a favorable uh upper upper end but it depends on how much you really kind of obsess over health and how protective you are of uh mental health and how complete you you want your your nutrient intake to be and so i'm I'm always going to personally default to omnivorism for that Mm -hmm. Uh, and that is not to say that there is an innumerable amount of people doing well excluding animal foods but um i don't personally want to incur any of the risks and sub optimizations associated with it you should talk to eric trexler about that (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh, is he? Is he? Is cool? he all plant based cool? now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He is. Yeah. No, uh, well, I, I, well, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll mention. I actually talked to him next week, so um, I'm just gonna mm-hmm. explore some of that. The interesting. And as we get older, the idea of anabolic resistance, which I, I haven't honestly dived into too much, but how big of a deal is that phenomenon? Like, how why does it happen, and what can we do about it? Like, is it, is it, is it related to age, or is it related to kind of a loss of muscle mass most people have because they haven't been training, for example? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, that, that's a good, actually a good transition, like a a hundred percent plant-based and the elderly population, those are two things that don't go well. Mm. And, um, that's because there are certain critical aspects of, of the diet that, um, can be fulfilled more feasibly with an omnivorous diet, uh, in the elderly than with, um, with a completely plant-based diet, unless you can convince elderly folks to eat the volume of foods and the types of foods and the supplementation of, um, let's say protein sources and the use of, uh, um, engineered plant protein type sources that could hypothetically cover their, their essential amino acids and their protein needs to protect against sarcopenia. Um, that can be an issue. And so, uh, now even when you do that, you're still not going to get all the nutrients that are available within animal foods. You're still not going to get any collagen. And there is quite a lot of research showing the benefits of, um, of collagen supplementation, getting collagen within the diet. Um, the role of collagen and even basic things like uh, tissue healing. Um, You're not going to get that. You're not going to get creatine unless you supplement with it. Uh, You're not going to get other things like carnitine, carnosine, answerine, um, the the debatable one, cholesterol, whether that's going to net help you or not. Um, And, and so a lot of these compounds like uh, marine based omega-3 EPA, DHA, especially DHA, you're going to have a hell of a time getting that um, in a, in an animal free diet, unless you supplement with an algal uh, based uh, DHA and EPA. And uh, 
So people who switch over to a full bore plant-based thing and they're doing it for ideological reasons, hey, have at it. Have at it, Eric. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> but both Eric, both Eric's. You know, I didn't Tre mean to Trexler, get that started. No, I think Trexler it's just and Helms. They, they can both have at it. Oh my um, god. <laughs> But uh, the reasons that I have not, even at the tender age of 51, crossed over to full plant-based and, and not even close is because I'm too protective of, my, of the optimization of my own personal health sure. and sure. my own personal longevity. Okay. I, 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 I don't think it's possible to take, um, to recreate the nutrition in animal-based foods and by throwing together a bunch of the compounds that we know at, at what which that might be the sum of the parts and attempting to create the whole in a plant-based form just color me skeptical but yeah okay yeah, that, yeah no that's, that's cool like, I, I i didn't know we were honestly going to go there because I, I was just curious about incorporating plants not so much going all the way plant based, but I'm glad you brought that up because because people ask that and you have a fairly definitive position on that 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 people should understand or at least the compromises and trade offs they're making if they decide to go one way or the other and have to make decisions to to fill in the gaps. Um, okay, and, and I, <laughs> so. I am very I'm very live and let live. I, I think that people have the right to take that take the plant based road. Sure. Um, and a lot of people do quite well. And I mean, at the population level and at the sort of at the, at the general population level, the people who do veganism properly, they, they do very well. Mm -hmm. um, I just, uh, you know, personally for, for myself and uh, even my loved ones, I, I, I wouldn't, I'd put a, a little bit of a blockade on that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so no, it's all good. It's all good, man. Uh, you know, just, and, and, yeah. and I have many, I have many vegan friends. I have many yeah, sure. vegan friends. Sure. And I'm glad that, that they, uh, that, you know, not every vegan is live and let live in this aspect, but I'm glad my vegan friends are, are very live and let live with me as right. an omnivore <clears throat> rather than kind of judging and then excluding and condemning. But, uh, yeah, the judge excluding can and condemn thing. Mm. Yeah, no, I agree. Do yeah. Dogma and, and putting up those walls and everything. We don't need that. Um, oh, well, okay. So let's get in another hot topic. Maybe not hot topic, but it's it's an interesting one. And that's nonlinear dieting. And intermittent fasting is the big one that comes out yeah. of there. But there's also other many other strategies you talk about in the book. One one thing I wanted to ask about specifically, well, we can talk about that uh, time-restricted feeding, but also um, carb cycling in the context of uh, when somebody is in a fat loss phase and they just don't have many calories to work with, you know, they have low calories, maybe two or three meals a day. Um, is there any value in the nonlinear dieting approach like carb cycling for that or intermittent fasting for, for that matter? The kind of the anticlimactic answer, Philip, <laughs> is that it depends. Um, <laughs> it, it depends on whether the person yeah. prefers it. Sure. It depends on whether okay. the person prefers it. So the conditions where nonlinear dieting uh, work best are usually under conditions where somebody, um, well, A, prefers it. And um, if we're talking about just like, like meal frequency, are we talking about meal frequency in general or are we talking about carb intake specifically? Um. <sighs> That's a good question, right? Because there's both the protein carb distribution because of your workouts, for example, to make sure you have enough carbs around your workouts. Mm -hmm. And there's also the um, muscle protein synthesis, right? So all of these come into play. It's like, should we squeeze everything using time-restricted feeding? Because I'm also going to be ravenous <laughs> the other times for some people. And is it going to like throw all this other stuff out the window or is it just fine? You know, like whatever works for you, it's good enough. Yeah, it, you know, it it depends on really kind of depends on on the scenario. Yeah, depends on the goal. So it's like you know, with with these questions, it's like what's the goal and what's the population. So with, let's take an extreme population like competitive bodybuilders or competitive physique athletes. There's almost always going to be a 
carb cycling or a calorie cycling type of model, mm -hmm. especially towards towards the end in the deep spots of prep where you're not going to be going linear, low calorie to where those spikes or those carb ups are going to both serve as a psychological boost as well as a boost um, in training capacity to kind of preserve that during, during those stretches. And so if somebody has a large amount of carbs allotted to them daily, then the need for cycling them is close to nil. Now, if somebody is taking a low carb model or a ketogenic diet model, then a nonlinear approach to carb intake can, can boost adherence and it can improve training performance on certain days. And so it really depends on, uh, the individual situation. And so now if we go uh, away from carbs and onto just meals in general, that truly just depends on the individual's preference. Some people prefer a grazing pattern. Um, whereas some people prefer more of a, a, a gorging pattern where instead of eating like four to six small meals a day, they're eating like two to three larger meals a day. And there's really no advantage specific to each of those or exclusive to each of those beyond the person's personal preference for them yep. for okay. either one of those. And, uh, the intermittent fasting topic is, is really, it is really fascinating. And we've looked at that quite a bit. I just wrote, um, a kind of a monstrous review on intermittent fasting's effects on body composition. Apparently the human species is just extremely tolerant and resilient of such a wide range of permutations of the meal frequencies through the day and through the week that it honestly almost doesn't matter to the point where it's really all about personal preference and what your goal is. So the different variants of intermittent fasting are interesting to look at because you have the one variant, which is just concentrating your feeding window to a shorter time period in the day. So time-restricted eating or time-restricted feeding, as we used to call it. Uh, and this was popularized by Martin Burke and, you know, when, when and, and Ori Hoffmeckler with the warrior diet, where you give yourself somewhere between usually five, six, eight hours to eat mm -hmm. your, mm -hmm. to eat all the food in your day. Um, there's a lot of research, research been done on that with and without training. Um, there's been a lot of research on alternate day fasting, uh, whether it be zero calorie alternate day fasting or a little bit more gentle model where on your in quotes fasting days, you're eating like about 500 ish calories a day. Um, that's the Krista Verity model of alternate day fasting. And then there's, uh, the twice weekly fasting or the five, two model, which is an even more gentle version mm -hmm. of the alternate mm -hmm. day fasting. So all of these models have been studied. All of these models have done comparably well to daily caloric restriction for weight loss and fat loss. Um, but then the subtleties and the nuances there are interesting too, depending on what, what goal you're looking at. Right. Um, <clears throat> but okay. A misconception with fasting is that it's, better for your health and better for longevity. Um, due, due to all sorts of uh, theories, autophagy or whatever else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So sure. that's not, that's not true. That's just yep, a bunch yep. of speculations. Yep. And in fact, the leaner you get, the leaner and more fit you get, the more risky fasting becomes for the preservation of lean mm. body mass. Yes. Yeah, no, I, I, this is great. And I'll tell you, I've personally tried various forms of, of IF over the years, uh, lean gains protocol, fasted training, whatever. And I always came back to just eating when I kind of felt right. And by that, that tends to work, right? Because it's sustainable. And I, I love that people can hear this and just continue to dispel these myths and realize that it's so simple. I mean, it can be simple. It's like, what works for you? And then the other variables that you have to tweak to get to your goal, get there, but don't try to go after this next shiny thing or some, you know, pet theory, uh, just because whatever you're doing now maybe isn't working for other reasons, but like consistency and adherence. So 
it's a good message and we, we keep hammering it home. So I thank you for that. Um, I know we're running short on time, so I'm just going to ask my second to last question, which I ask all my guests. And that is Alan, what one question did you wish I had asked and what is your answer? Dude, can I tell you that I, I read the show notes and I read that damned question and I'm like, I am genuinely stumped. <laughs> God, I'm stumped. You're not um, the only one. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I lean towards maybe wanting to be asked if there's something else that I would rather be doing than what I'm doing. Oh, that's like, an interesting if, one. Okay. In, in a, okay. If you had, if a genie could just kind of wave a wand over you and would give you your dream job or your dream vocation, you know, you're just your dream mm -hmm. situation. Mm -hmm. Would you, what, what would that be? And I, I am at a loss for thinking of what I enjoy more than what I'm doing right now, which is researching and teaching and striving for self-improvement and helping others do that. The same thing. So I can't think, I can't think of it. But then now here's the hilarious part, okay? About 25 years ago, I was at the gym and this older guy, he, he just struck up a conversation with me and he said, um, okay, check this out, man. This is, uh, everybody claims that they wanna be this or that or, or what, they wanna become this or, or that, but Here's the thing that everybody would want to be regardless. Here's the thing every guy would leave their job for, no matter what you work as. And I'm like, okay, what? He's all a male supermodel. <laughs> what? <laughs> I didn't see that coming. I thought it was just something profound. <laughs> and I'm looking at him and he, and he says, I'm serious. Every guy would leave the job for that. Imagine that. You get paid millions of dollars to stand there and look good. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you don't have to go through the process of trying to look good, because that's the hard part. <laughs> and that was super duper hilarious. Yeah. And, and then there's another hilarious story attached to that, where I've done these, um, these talks on succeeding in the fitness industry. Like, how to how to succeed. Okay. And so my, my definition, my personal definition of, of success is doing what you love to do, but what, what you're actually doing is something you would not trade out for any other, other job, any other career. So if you're doing what you love more than anything, it's more than any other kind of career that you can think of career position or whatever that you can think of, then you're succeeding if you're sure. doing that. And, um, and yeah, and, meaning you don't have to have a certain result doing that just yet. You've already succeeded because you're doing what you love, right? You, yeah. You're cause you're, cause you're doing what you love. And if you're doing what you love and, and then, then you, you're successful. Now, now this is the super funny part. I gave this talk and my friend, Brad Schoenfeld, was in the audience and he yelled this out like <laughs> in the middle of me saying, okay, so I'm trying to think of exactly how I said it. So I get this right. I said, um, if you're, oh, oh, okay. No, no, no. Yeah. I, I said, I, I feel like I've succeeded because there's, there's no, nobody out there whose shoes I, I would trade, you know, whether it's, whether it's Tom Cruise or Lord knows what, you know, think of a celebrity, think of a, somebody who has it mm -hmm. all or anything. Mm -hmm. There's nobody out there who I would trade places with. And then Brad Schoenfeld yells from the audience, except Brett. <laughs> Super hilarious <laughs> because, because Brett, you know, as much as we like, like to think our jobs are awesome. Like, of course, Brett, Brett got it figured out better than we did. Right. Yeah. So, so, so it was just amazing. He said, he yelled it out loud. The, the audience just died laughing. 
because they get the joke. And um, so, yeah. So uh, aside from maybe a supermodel or Brett, yeah. Um, <laughs> Got it. <laughs> no, it's a good question. I wouldn't have, wouldn't have thought to ask you that because you do seem to just love what you do. So I wouldn't even have, I wouldn't even have dared, you know, <laughs> question I do, that. I do love it, man. Yeah. No, that's yeah. awesome. That's awesome. So I, I could have easily asked you a million more questions, um, but let's just end with how, how people can best reach out to you and learn about you. AlanAragon.com is the hub of everything. Um, my largest social media platform is Instagram. And I'm occasionally on Twitter and Facebook and even more rarely on, on TikTok for better, cool. probably. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Yeah. TikTok. I know so many platforms. Okay. So I'll go, I'll put those in the show notes. People easily be able to find you, of course. And this was a pleasure and an honor, Alan. I really appreciate you, uh, you know, replying to my invitation when I reach out to you by video on IG actually, and coming on the show. It was, it was awesome. Thank you for coming on. 